Um, if you want to grow, you got to go out of your comfort zone. You can't do what you do every single day. Hello. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and thank you for tuning in to episode 242. Today, we hear from Shihan Mike Sartwell, a martial arts practitioner and instructor from New Hampshire. He's the owner of Nemo Martial Arts, and he's a man with a powerful story. I want to thank you for tuning in. As I said, my name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel, and I'm your host on Martial Arts Radio. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for spending some time with me. Thanks for spending some time with Shihan Sartwell. And I want to thank everyone for the 241 episodes that led up to this one, all the wonderful support you have shown us. If you're new to the show, you might want to check out all the great things that we've got going on, and you can find all of them at whistlekick.com. From martialartscalendar.com to martialartsmemes.com, all the multitude of websites that we produce, as well as our wonderful award-winning sparring gear, our great apparel, some accessories, just good stuff. And it's all out there to benefit you, the traditional martial artist. We don't talk about it very much, but we are exclusively a traditional martial arts supplier. You are never going to see MMA products coming from us. Why? because there are plenty of other people making great MMA stuff, and we are choosing to focus on the world that we know best, the world that I know best, the traditional martial arts. Our guest today, Shihan Mike Sartwell, of the National Institute of Modern Martial Arts in New Hampshire, not too far from me. To be honest, I'm excited with this interview because it's long overdue. He's a martial artist from way back, from reading books and movies, to his first training when he was a teen. Shion Sartwell has a very interesting story involving the choice between two things that he holds dear. So let's hear that story. Shion Sartwell, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Awesome. I'm glad to be here. Hey, I'm glad to have you here. You know, it's, I, I will take full responsibility. You should have been on the show a while ago. I apologize for not inviting you. And I think because I thought I did. You know, there's a whole list. Listeners, you, you, you may imagine there's a list of people that, are, are on the ask list, and sometimes they take a while to, to make it on, and sometimes they say no because they're too busy, or, or maybe they say no for other reasons that we won't get into. But it's a long list, and it's hard to remember who's on the list and who's not on the list, and it was just completely my fault that you weren't on the list. So I'm sorry. Well, I, I certainly do appreciate that, um, and, and I'm happy to talk to you today, though, for sure. Great. I'm happy to talk to you, too. And, you know, I, I'm looking forward to, to learning more about you because I've, I've gotten to know you listeners. You know, we're not too far away from each other. I've enjoyed getting to know, she, getting to know Shihan over the last couple of years with tournaments and everything else that we've got going on. But I really don't know you that well. So this is going to be my opportunity to learn more about you just as all the listeners are going to learn about you. So I'm excited. Perfect. Okay. We start in a way that seems kind of boring, but I, I think we've got to start there. How did you become a martial artist? Well, I mean, I have to say, I think I always wanted to be a martial artist. Even, even when I was a kid, before I took official lessons, I mean, I watched the movies. I mean, I remember having mock fights um, in the backyard with my imaginary um, ninja foes. Um, but when I was 17, my older um, sister um, started taking martial arts, and I asked her if I could go along. I did. Two months later, she quit, and I never did. This is I'm really marked my 30th year doing martial arts this year. Wow. So you always wanted to, to do martial arts. You watched the movies. I mean, that, that's kind of a, a similar origin story to the majority of the guests that we've had on the show, I'd say, especially folks of, of, of our age-ish. You know, it doesn't seem to be what brings in newer folks but you know certainly those that, that were training in the 60s to 90s or definitely but why I, I guess that that's where i want to dig in well i do have to say um i mean my childhood i mean even though i look back on it fondly and in in my head it was i mean i was very i was a very happy kid but i certainly had some struggles growing up i mean my dad was an alcoholic, and uh, I mean, he was on the abusive side, 
And so, I mean, maybe the martial arts was just a way to help me kind of power myself above that. I remember watch. Um, I mean, I read a lot of comic books when I was a kid. I mean, I was. I mean, I'm on the smaller side, frame wise, especially especially back then before the martial arts. And I think that was just a way for me to kind of empower my my body and my mind to to bring me up out of that that weak um, dominant state. Okay. Awesome. So what was it, you know, you, you, you started and, and you must've found something because you have a school now, you know, not everyone sticks with the martial arts, certainly doesn't stick with the martial arts as long as you have. What was it you found must've been fairly early that grabbed you? Well, what held you and in? I have to say, I mean, I think I, I mean, it felt to me like I was a natural I mean, I didn't play basketball or football or soccer. I mean, I wasn't into athletics as a, as a kid. I didn't do any athletics in high school at all. But the first time walking out on the floor, I mean, it just felt natural for me. I remember being in my first school, I mean, at the yellow belt level, beating the brown belts and um, sparring and and just feeling like it was a super good fit for me. And I mean, I had an instructor, um, well, m- more, I mean, he, he, I go to his seminars. I like him a lot. Todd Labrie, he's from, he's from California. And he, he talks about that the students who stick with it find success in the beginning. And that's one of the, I mean, that's one of the secrets of having retention is making sure that your, your kids find success in the very beginning of their training because they love to be successful, and then that's how they fall in love with it. If you're kind of too harsh on them in the beginning and they don't have that success, that is a perfect way to lose a student. That makes a lot of sense. And how have you worked to make sure they see those early successes? Is, is it similar to what you experienced when you started, or have you gone off and, and developed some different techniques? Yeah, well, I mean, it is a hundred percent different from when I when when I started. I mean, I came back from, I mean, my my first instructor was um, David Stepp in New London, um, was Shaolin um, Kenpo, and I did I did two years with him, and um, it was pretty hard training, and then I went then I my second school I started in '89 was the National Institute of Modern Martial Arts, whom I'm heading now. Um, yeah, and I have to say it, it was a small school with a, um, a hardcore militaristic type instruction where you're at attention a lot and it was very, very stressful. Um, and I have to say that our school was pretty small at that time because only one or 2% of the population can handle that type of training. Um, so the, so one of the things, one of my other mentors, um, 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 Tony Fournier in Maine, he, he talks about, do you want a excellent white belt or do you want an excellent black belt? So, so if you're pushing the, the white belts too soon and expecting them to be at black belt level at white belt, that is a great way to lose that student. Uh, so, so the trick is, is not, to, not to bash their confidence in the beginning and allow them to be successful within their own pace because every student is different. So if you can allow each student to be successful at white belt and nurture them up to black belt and make sure they're excellent at black belt because they don't have to be black belt level at white belt. That makes sense. And it's certainly something that's, it can be difficult. I, you know, I, I know you teach and I know that a lot of the folks that we have listening have instructed, whether it's their own school or, or just assisting. It can be really hard to let people be where they're at and and remember that they've got to get to where you're trying to get them. They're they're not going to just instantly get there, and that's why I'm so firmly encouraging of people to always remain a student because if you if you reach a point where you're only an instructor, it's easy to forget what it's like to be a student. And I, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I think students make better teachers. Oh, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I mean, I, I always have somebody that I'm going to to continue my education through um, both um, as a martial artist and as a business owner um, because both of those take 
you know, a lot of skill really. And you can't expect to do it on your own, even if you've been doing it for 30 years. Um, you should always have an instructor, um, that, to, a mentor to help you along. You can never get anywhere you want to go on your own. I agree. Completely agree. Cool. We're get, starting to build a picture of who you are and, and what makes you tick. But now it's story time. I love stories. All right. Stories are the foundation of this show, as everyone knows. And I'd love to know, what is your favorite martial arts story? My favorite martial arts story. So, I mean, I, mean, I, have, some, I have some martial arts stories. Like, I remember um, being and doing a school talk with my instructor. It must have been maybe 1990, I think. I mean, I was a brown belt at the time. We're in the class and we're standing at attention, and he's lecturing the, the class on how martial arts can, I mean, makes it so you can block out pain, and you can be focused, and you can carry through. And um, he turned around, and he elbowed me <laughs> so hard in the chest that knocked me back into the desk. And I remember, and I jumped back up, and I snapped back at it as, um, into attention, thinking, holy cow, man, that really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so in in my head, I was like thinking, um, well, maybe it didn't block out the physical pain, but it certainly has enabled me to control my body despite of the pain, um, and which is a good lesson to learn as we become an older martial artist. Because if you're still training, <laughs> something always hurts. Hard to get a, get away from that pain. What was the student's reaction? I mean, they were like, wow. Oh, they, they were. They, they thought it was the coolest thing they ever saw. Well, I'm like going keepers, <laughs> man. He, he got me pretty good. I think a lot of us. But can... but, but, but the, and that was um, Grandmaster Gonthier. He was my instructor from 1989 to um, 1998. So so I spent a lot of time um, a time with him, and he certainly became one of my. Um, role models, father figure. I mean, he, he spent a lot, a lot of time kind of molding me. You use the, the term father figure, and that's not something that everyone uses, you know, in describing their instructor, that, that parental or pseudo-parental relationship. It sounds like maybe there was a little bit more there than, than just yeah, teaching? Yeah, we, we, we really, I mean, we spent 10 years being together almost every single day because, um, I mean, I, but I, I tell my kids, if you want to get good at martial arts, there's three secrets. Come to class, work as hard as you can in class, and practice at home. I mean, that's the secret to success. There's no, there's no shortcut to that. So I went to class twice a day, um, every day for, I mean, for my whole life. I've, I've always trained more than once a day, every day for, for, my, for my whole entire life. And he was there, and he was, um, I mean, he was on top of me all the, all the time. Um, and he put me in some tough situations. I remember that I just got my black belt. It was probably 1991, 1992. And um, he, um, Murphy's Gym in Manchester. I'm, I'm not, I, I don't even think, I'm not sure if they're even still open. I, I'm, I don't think so. And um, he called up and they were looking for some, some people to do some kickboxing. And, um, he hung up the phone and he came out and he said, all right, grab your gear. We're going to Manchester tonight and you're going to do your first kickboxing match. And luckily I won, but I have to say that was, um, that was a, an experience for being a tournament fighter who's never even walked into a kickboxing ring or trained kickboxing. Um, that was a, quite the experience. But he, I think, I mean, in his mind, if he was challenging me, I was growing. So if he let me kind of stay where I'm comfortable I mean, that's not a place where you want to be. And again, I tell my students that um, if you want to grow, you got to go out of your comfort zone. You can't do what you do every single day and expect, expect different results. So I'm always telling them, challenge yourself, do a tournament, do something you haven't done. And I mean, I've tried to done that my whole life is try to pick something new all the time that I haven't done before. Because if you're not going forward, you're moving backwards. I like that. I, I can imagine what it must have been like to to hear you're competing in a kickboxing match this evening with what sounds like zero kickboxing preparation yeah i did nothing i was just i mean 
I mean, I was a tournament fighter, and I like tournament fighting, and I, and I competed quite a bit in that round. But it's a whole different game. <laughs> so I didn't know the rules. I remember, I mean, I remember just doing stupid things. Like, I would, like, lean on the rope, <laughs> put my hands up, just lean away, and I would just kick the guy as they came in, and I, I guess that's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, I'm sure I didn't look like the most polished kickboxer, even though I did win that match. Was that your only kickboxing match? No, I did one one other. Um, so I have a record of one and one, and winning is way more fun. <laughs> I remember fighting the guy. I mean, I was winning. I, I mean, busted his nose up in the first round, and I mean, blood everywhere. And I was feeling pretty confident until um, for the next two rounds, he just covered up and stepped inside of me. And you know, he didn't he didn't knock me out, but um, I mean, I think it was a pretty close fight. But he ended up winning. He ended up winning, winning that match. So I have a one and one. So I did two matches, and that was enough because. I mean, I want to protect my head. Right. Right. As you said, winning is a lot more fun. And the moment you take that first loss, it, it kind of changes your perspective. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you have a lot of time for it, but outside of martial arts, are there things that you're passionate about? Um, no, I mean, I really have really dedicated every spare moment to the martial arts my whole entire life. I mean, when I was younger, I used to do a lot of triathlons, which I thought was, I mean, that was fun. I mean, I've done marathon running. Um, I mean, I don't do that anymore because if I'm not, I'm running the school and training. I'm, I mean, I'm hanging out with my, my two beautiful girls and my wife. Doesn't sound like a bad life. Training, no, teaching, I say, and family. I, I and... Have the, yeah, I have the best life ever. I mean, I teach martial arts. I mean, I'm healthy. My family, my family is beautiful. And my little girls adore me. <laughs> I mean, and you will never hear me complain about anything because my life is perfect. When did you know you wanted to be a, a martial arts instructor? Well, I mean, I, rem- my, I remember the first few months of tr- um, in martial arts, I was standing in front of the mirror trying to make working on all the techniques that we worked in class, throwing punches, making sure my alignment was ready. And I was, and I remember saying, no matter what, I'm going to get my black belt. I mean, just from the very first day on the, on the floor, um, I remember doing that. And then, and of course my instructor, I was running my own class at purple belt. I mean, just, uh, I mean, year and a half in my instructor gave me my own class to teach. And that class became one of the, the more popu- most popular classes in, um, at that time in the school. So, I mean, I just really love sharing. And if I could do martial arts um, with anybody, I was, I was just thrilled and happy with that. I want to talk about that for a second, because the idea of having someone, you know, purple belt in your system is, is a, a middle rank, right? Would, would you right, that intermediate fair? level, yeah. Okay. That's not something that's going to happen in a lot of schools. I mean, I, I think most right, of us and, and, it, and I have to say it won't happen in my school now, but so we have to think when I was taking lessons back in my school, we might have had 30 to 40 students training at that time. Mm-hmm. So the bench strength wasn't very, very big. Um, there was no other, there is no other really um, instructor to teach a class. Right. Right. But I, so it was kind of out of necessity. Sure. But now that NIMA has been around for the, I mean, the school, the same school that I'm running now has been around since 98. Um, I have, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I mean, I have 40 black belts, um, and, and active black belts, any given time training. Wow. So I have, so I wouldn't, you're right, I would not do that now. But back then, there wasn't a whole lot of extra black belts. So it was out of necessity, I think, at that time. Well, and, and where I'm going to go with this is, is certainly not a critical place. Uh, just bear with me for a moment. I, I think a lot of okay. us, as, as you've said, you know, sometimes it's out of necessity. You know, if you're, if you're teaching a class and there's a very clear distinction in, in what needs to be taught, sometimes there's a benefit in taking someone who maybe, maybe isn't ready in the traditional sense to lead. But I'm going to guess that you rose to the occasion number one. And number two, that was pretty formative in your desire to teach and move on. When I asked you, when did you know? That's when you're expressing that you, you knew, you knew earlier 
then, you know, probably most people, most people don't get the opportunity to teach at that level, at that rank. And there's a lot yeah, of benefit. Well, Anybody that's yeah, ever tried to agree. teach so, really basic stuff so, for the first time knows, holy cow, teaching and knowing are two very different things. Right. Yeah, teaching certainly is a place, right? I mean, nothing really comes together until you teach it. I mean, you, every little minor detail, um, if you know it or not, you, you know immediately if you need, if you have that technique or not. So <clears throat> the difference is that I was thrown into the class. He gave me the key. I opened the door and I taught the class. Um, I mean, so do I let my younger, my lower brown belts and uh, higher inter intermediates teach? Yes, I do. I, I actually encourage it. And if they really want to progress quicker, it's kind of required. But what I would never do is give them the floor and leave the floor and go do something else, which would happen to me. I mean, if you're going to be a good teacher and if you want to keep the quality of your school up, you've got to teach them to teach. You've got to give them... You've got to give them small parts of your class and give them feedback and, and give them some like, direction on how you want them to teach the class. If you're not doing that, you're, you're letting them flounder. Maybe they're developing bad techniques. That's like teaching your students um, a move and leaving the floor and never checking on them if, if they've improved on, or not. So it's a process just like anything else. If you want good instructors, you've got to train them to be good instructors. Absolutely. Martial arts is the only <clears throat> pursuit I'm aware of where we just kind of wholesale assume once you know something, you know how to teach it. That's right, and it's not, it's not the case. And it, it is I mean, the exact and Luckily, opposite. martial arts for me has been, is, I mean, I, I must have some sort of natural ability. But hey, here's another martial arts story. My first class ever teaching as, as a purple belt. I mean, I have the class, and we're doing you know, Ippon Kumite, which is one-step sparring. And I remember my, the person in front of me wasn't um, doing it as well as I want them to. So every time they missed, I would block and I would puck them in the ribs a little bit to kinda, so they know that, that they, weren't, they, they weren't in right position. And I remember that then afterwards there was a complaint that I was being hard on the students. In my head, I was just teaching them where the opening was, but, but obviously there was – if I had an instructor with me, they might have been able to curb me from making that mistake in the beginning, where, where, which I would never do now because that just doesn't make sense. That's just not the best way to teach. So there were some errors I made along the way, not having maybe that, that direct, this is how you teach skills um, um, with me. Yeah, I, I'm going to guess everybody out there that's taught before for more than a, a little while at least has had that experience of maybe going a little hard, expecting a little bit too much, because we've all been the subject of the the instructor, you know, expecting more from us, rising to that occasion and realizing in hindsight, hey, I am capable of more than I thought, especially at lower ranks. But then, you know, sometimes we overshoot on our expectation of lower students and uh, maybe drill them a little bit harder than we need to. Yeah, because... <laughs> Because I mean that's how I was taught. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, mean, I, mean, he, I mean, and I'm not even saying my instructor probably wouldn't have done the same thing at that time. But I think I think I have a better way now, um, and just through going out and and making sure that my skills were um, constantly improving. How has your your teaching changed over the years? Well, I I have to say that. I'm actually probably more patient than I used to be. I'm less critical. I, I mean, I, I, I Oreo a little bit more, making sure that, that I'm not busting my students' morale and confidence. What do you I mean by that? I, I, I get the metaphor, but I just oh, want everybody yeah, to understand. Yeah, so, so what you don't want to do <clears throat> is just bash on your student all the time and keep telling them, no, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. What are you doing? Keep, you know, where's your power? Man, you're really not doing well. Man, your guys are sucking out pretty much tonight. So if you do that, then you're breaking their confidence. And I can't tell my parents that martial arts instills confidence in your students if I'm busting their confidence. So what, so what I try to tend to do, if they're making a mistake, I try to frame it with, 
man, man, your, your hands are up. That's really, really good. Maybe you should rotate your shoulder a little bit more and extend the arm to, to, to increase your power. And, and man, you've really been coming across a lot. Good job. Just keep it up. Just, just make sure you're kind of I mean, hitting, hitting that technique a little bit better. So that way they, I mean, they're hearing, oh, I'm, my hands are up. I'm doing okay. I just need to work on this one thing, and then I can improve. Instead of just saying, man, where's your power? Or how come you're not, I mean, how come you're not throwing it harder today? Because yelling at your students to hit harder is not, not teaching. <laughs> I mean, you, got, you kind of have to kind of give them a little bit more than that. I had a, uh, a great example of, of that last night. I was working with my instructor. He had handed off some lower ranks to me, and we're going over some pretty fundamental stuff, and what it was doesn't really matter so much. But instruction that I was giving that just seemed so clear that would have been completely apparent to anybody from a middle rank on up was completely lost on these novice children. And I had to get in there and actually manipulate their body for them to be able to tie my verbal instruction to what I wanted their body to do. And once I did that with each of them, it was a whole different story. Yeah, I mean, it, right. I mean, part of, the, part of the whole teaching mechanism is you got to figure out, I mean, are they verbal, visual, tactile? I mean, there's, and you kind of, if, if one way is not working, you got to be able to switch it up quickly um, to kind of hit more of the group with their learning style and that's challenging and that takes that takes some skill and some practice yeah absolutely one of the things that's kind of universal to life even though you said you have a, a perfect life i'm sure it wasn't always i'm sure there were times that things didn't go so well you know right but as a martial artist you have a, a few more tools in your toolbox to pull from to move through those difficult times Tell us about one of them and how your martial arts helps. Um, so, so you're talking about a low part of my life. Yeah, yeah, some some All kind right, of challenge. So, so I'll let I'm you gonna, define I'm that, gonna, however. Okay, I'm going to blend that with one of the high points of my life. So my my high point and my low point of my life was um, the same day. So, um, 2000, July 31st, 2010. I had been in the hospital with my wife for about two weeks. Um, my, she was just, um, she was just at 20, um, almost 25 weeks pregnant and the baby was coming if we wanted it to or not. So I'm at the hospital and my, um, my daughter was born one, one pound, 10 ounces. She was little, little, little. So if I get emotional, I, I apologize. I still have a hard time with that. Um, so we're in the hospital, and she was sick. I mean, she had, um, she had an infection. She was, um, she was in an intubator. She was, un, she was, I mean, in her incubator, they were warm and monitors, and they're drawing blood and the stuff down her throat. It was, um, it was a scary day. It was a scary day. And, um, so at that time I was doing physical therapy and I had to decide right there because I didn't know what was going to happen. She could have had physical mental deficits and I didn't know what to do. So I either had to quit my physical therapy job or I had to quit karate. And, and at that time, I mean, I was, I mean, I taught for free karate free for 20 years. I never made um, a dime on, on my training. I, I love teaching. I love the school. I love my students. So I just taught for free because I was making money as a physical, doing physical therapy. So I had to quit either physical therapy or my, um, or karate. And I have to say, I'll never quit karate. So I quit my physical therapy job. I mean, I, I gave my notice. I told them, I mean, I have to take care of my daughter. She's sick. She's going to be in the hospital for months. Um, so I did that. So I was with my daughter. She was in the um, hospital for three months. And um, so we brought her home. She was on oxygen. So I had, I mean, she needed constant, constant care. Um, So, but she started to get better. And so at that time, I had five other people kind of running the school. We we had bought a building together. Um, No one was really, no one was making any money. 
and I and they knew that I needed to do something. So they all stepped away. I mean, amazing people, including um, Ramona Hastings, Todd Savage, uh, who are still associated with the school today. Um, they stepped away. They they said, "Here's the school." And I have to say, I don't think they thought I was going to be able to make a living off the school. I pretty sure I might have heard that from them. <laughs> um, so, so I took over the school. Um, I brought my daughter home, and then she started getting better. She started getting better. So today she's seven years old. She's absolutely beautiful. She's smart. She's help, um, healthy, and um, and if it for my indomitable spirit through the martial arts and my and just the effort and the sincerity that it, it, it took to, to make all this happen, it, it could have turned out, it could have turned out differently. And my wife, she, um, she's awesome. I mean, she's a strong willed, um, person and she was on those doctors and making sure that they're doing what, um, they need to do. Um, my wife's a nurse practitioner, by the way. So she, is, she certainly has training and she kept, she kept those doctors and nurses, honest and on task. So, um, so I mean, I have lots of thanks for her too, for, for doing that. So that was certainly one of the lowest parts of my life. And just the community of martial artists that were surrounding me, um, they just made it all happen for me. And and I'm forever grateful to them. It's a pretty powerful story. And and certainly anybody that's been through that can relate and and not just that specific story, but you know, the, the love of a child that is maybe not on, on the easiest path, especially at, at a young age. But when did you, you were willing to step into martial arts. You were willing to step in and make a career out of something that had never made you money. Right. That's a tremendous leap of faith. And I, I'm wondering if you can tell us about your mindset in doing that. Because you must have you must have had faith. You must have believed that it was going to work out. I mean, people don't make that jump believing it's not going to work out. So what was yeah, it that I, made I, you feel it, it would? Yeah, I knew, I knew it was going to work out. It's, um, so um, at that time um, when this was happening, the... Um, CVS, we, we owned a building in town uh, right next to where they put the CVS. So they bought that building from us. So we each got a little bit of money. And so the, so the, 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 the other five people, they took their share and they, and they, and they left. So, so, so they, made, they, made, they made a little extra money there. And I took all of that money and I refitted out a new space um, for the school. Um, but still it, it wasn't enough. So I, I guess I'm going to do some promoting for some consultants. <laughs> so at that time I joined, uh, Maya, which is, I'm not sure if people know what Maya is. It's the martial arts industry association and they help business owners, um, run their business. Mm-hmm. So I, I started out with them. And um, I talked to them, so I joined their most basic program. is like seventy nine dollars a month. So they kind of help with some little bit of marketing, and I did that, and that was fairly successful. So I felt my business was starting to grow a little bit. So the next year, I went up to their next level, which is their Edge program, and so they really help you with um, on on the computer on their site with marketing and how to get new students. And then on the third year, I joined their Maya Elite, which is their, one of their top consulting agency. And I started traveling to Las Vegas, and they do a couple other um, events in the year. And from doing that, my business just kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it is still growing. It, it still hasn't stopped. So, I mean, I added other programs, such as my before and after school program, um, and I actually joined another um, consulting group for that, um, the martial arts success team, MAST, who are specializes in before and after school. So I have them consulting me, and that program is getting bigger and bigger. So it's just like, um, my, so I kind of figured my, 
my business is the same as my training that I need to find some good instructors to kind of help me move forward. So, so that's what I did. So that's, kind of, I guess that's the, the, my, my story on how the business grows using mm-hmm. consultants, which I still belong, belong to those groups. Cause I mean, they still help me every, I mean, every month. That's great. Awesome. You've named quite a few people in the course of, of our conversation that have been influential on not just your martial arts, but your life, your, your school. And, you know, it, it's actually, it's quite the compliment of people that you've had in your circles to help you move forward. And, and I would argue that most successful people have quite a few around them that have helped that they've learned from. If you had to pick one of those people who has been the most influential and let's, let's take out the instructor that you started teaching for the, the man that unfortunately passed away. Let's take him out of the mix because we've already heard quite a bit about him from the folks that are left. Who would you say has been the most influential? Well, I mean, people in, influence you in different ways. So, um, Ramona Hastings, who's, um, you know, she's, she's one of the founders of NEMA. Um, she's influenced me on just giving me the ability to, to, to have the school and, and to kind of run from it. Um, so she was very influential. Um, Dr. Halford Jones, he was very influential in my martial arts training. Um, he did the Filipino martial arts piece with me. And, um, and I really enjoy um, still practicing the Filipino piece of my training. Um, then there, I mean, I hope I can just give you a list because I can't just Go pick for one. It. Yeah, that's okay, fine. Okay, um, so um, Sensei John Whitman, um, I've been with him for 15 years. He's an amazing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Judo practitioner. So he actually brought Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo to my school, and he's been hugely influential in my physical training because I couldn't picture – now not having a grappling base is my striking base. It's because if you're not doing both, you're, you're missing, you're missing a piece. So I really feel way more confident in my martial arts skill, having the grappling piece with my striking piece. So he is hugely inf- influential in my training. Um, Todd Savage, he's my top student. He's been with me. I mean, I mean, over 20 years, he is, he has my back. I mean, if, um, if I need anything, he has never said no to me in his entire life. He, if, if he can help me, he, he would give me anything. So um, and if anybody can have a student like that, they are super, super lucky. He actually he runs my whole adult program for me now, and um, he, he's just awesome. So I mean that's I mean that's in my that's in my inner circle of people who have influenced me um, the most for um, for sure. Wow. Great folks, and it, it's clear how much respect and reverence you have for not just them but some of the other folks that you've mentioned today. And it's just something that has really struck me. You know, we we have a lot of people on the show, of course, and and everyone pays homage to someone at some point along the show. But there there just seems to be a, a bit more. I don't know if humility is the right word, but just appreciation. I, I guess that's where I'm going. More, more understanding of where you are because of these other folks that have come before you and, and just listening to you talk about them and nodding my head and saying, yeah, you know, I, I've, I had folks like that in my life that did this too or, or, or whatever else. So it's great to know that I'm not alone, that you're, you're in there too with a, a long line of folks that have helped you get where you are. Yeah, yeah. I, um, it, it's and and if we had all day, I mean, I, I have a I have a list of people who um, who has influenced my martial arts because I've always had an instructor outside of my immediate um, Nima circle. I mean, always. I always had a, had an instructor um, that I can depend on and, and get new information to bring back um, to the. To my students, I, um, I know I just got some stuff from Tony Fournier, um, who, who's my consultant actually, and he, he's amazing. He did a really, I mean, he's helped my school out um, tremendously. Nice. Now, if you could train with someone that you haven't, if you could add one person to that list, that mix of folks that have helped you get where you are, they could be alive, they could be dead, who would that be? 
Let's see. Who would I like to train with? I mean, it certainly would be fun to train with some of the old Okinawan masters. I know um, Hohan Soken um, from the Shorinru system. I, I would have liked to spend some time with him. I, I hear that he was a really down-to-earth, um, amazing instructor. Um, I, mean, I, think, I think that's who I would, I would pick because that was kind of where my lineage basically started with um, Shorinru karate. Let's talk about competition. You mentioned earlier that you'd been a tournament fighter and that you'd done a couple of kickboxing matches. Yeah, I Where does competition I fit my... in your life? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's all right. Where does competition fit in your life? Um, I, I have to say I started my competition training in 1987. Um, I remember winning um, forms and fighting as, as a white belt at that tournament, and I've, I, mean, I was hooked. Um, I, I mean, I have to say, I mean, I think that I am a fairly active competitor until I hang out with people who are really active <laughs> competitors. So, I mean, I've always trained, um, did maybe four to eight tournaments a year, even though some, some people blow me out of the water with that. So I consider that I was active, um, for me, I'm um, doing four to eight tournaments a year. I mean, I loved it. I have to say if some of my best friends, that I have, I've made through competing. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I certainly have won lots of trophies, lots of grands. I mean, I fought, I mean, I fought a lot of different people, but what I've gained out of the 30 years of competing is I've just made some of my best friends that I can ever think of is through the tournaments. I think that's one of the aspects of competition that a lot of people underestimate. They, they forget about that when you go to competition routinely, you're going to see some of the same people. Not only are you going to end up with some kind of hopefully friendly nemesis, someone to help push you to train harder, to get better. So you can, you know, hopefully best them the next time. But, you know, re remember the things that we do while we are training within our schools, the, the sweat, the, the blood, the, the effort, all of that comes through in competition too. So it's just another group of people that you can become friends with. And I've said it on the, on the show before, if it wasn't for my competitive career back when I was a teenager, I would not have had the contacts to make whistle kick a reality. It would not have happened. This show would not exist. Um, none of the products that we make would, would be the, a reality. It's only because of the friendships and, and the relationships that I've founded in competition that this has happened. So great to hear that again, I'm not the only one. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, and that's just a good, I mean, that's just a good example of presenting yourself. Well, treat people well, um, do your, um, be respectful, do your best and people will support, support you around you. That's, that's true. Agreed. Do you watch movies at all? Are you a fan of, of martial arts films? You said that they helped you get into martial arts, but do you yeah, still watch? I, I mean, I have to say, I used to watch um, a lot of martial arts movies until I have a family. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, you want, if you want me to talk about new movies, forget it. I, I have no idea what's happening out there. Um, but I think my favorite movie, uh, when I was coming up um, as, a, as a martial artist, was The Best of the Best. Mm. Um, I used to watch that film every, um, every, before every tournament. So I would watch that several, several times a year. And I would watch the training sequence and just get myself pumped up. And then they're out there competing. And even if it was hard, they, 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 they did it. Um, they may not have won, but, but they, they gave their all. And I just, I mean, I just really wanted to live that experience every single time. So I really liked the best of the best. It's a great film. Absolutely. If movies aren't something that, that really make time, that find time in your life now, how about books? Is, are there any books maybe related to your involvement with Maya or, you know, something that's more style-based? I mean, I, and I have to say, if you look at my library of martial arts book, I, which I have shelves of them, they're all technical books. Um, how to do jujitsu, judo books. And I have them all separated out from karate books, kung fu books, weapon books. So I have a pretty good library of um, how to do martial art books. 
Um, cause I've always liked to be, I, I never wanted to be in a box where I was only good at doing one thing. I really wanted to kind of have a more well-rounded martial arts base. Um, so one of my favorite books is the way of the warrior. What is it? Chris Crudelli, Crudelli. Um, he, it, which is a book on with great big pictures of all the martial arts of the world. So that's one of my favorite books. I, I have two copies and one of them I think I wore through. That's a book that's come up on the show before. And, and folks, just a reminder, in case you're new to the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we have the show notes. You'll be able to get links and photos and check out other episodes. And of course, you know, get, get the names of the, the books and anything else that we talk about. So if you're driving or running on a treadmill or something, you don't have to jot on your arm or risk a vehicular injury. <laughs> What's keeping you going? You've accomplished a lot. I mean, you, you went from training to your own school, a growing school. I mean, I think we can even say a flourishing school. You've got yes, a great flourishing. life. I mean, and... I, I just, yeah, I, I hit over, I'm going to hit over 200 students. Um, I, I, I'm, what I'm really looking for is, is to, do exactly, to do exactly what I'm doing. Um, teaching, teaching. Um, if I can keep being the successful, I might even try to hire out some of the administrative piece so I can just focus on teaching and maybe um, try to step away a little bit to spend more time with my family that's growing. So, I mean, just a little bit because, I mean, when, even if I take a week off, I, 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 miss, <laughs> I miss being on the dojo floor. I just, I just love it. I still love it. Every time I walk through the door, I still, still get that white belt feeling like, oh, I can't wait to do this technique with the group today. How have you kept that feeling? Well, I, I, I think I've kept that feeling by not doing um, – is branching out of the, the set curriculum of, of my school. If I've only done the set curriculum of my school for 30 years, I may not be as excited, I think. So when I step out and I do, when I learn a new judo or jujitsu technique, I do a Kenpo seminar, I do a weapons seminar, and I can bring back that, that material, I think that keeps me, keeps me fresh. I mean, what, like, like I, I mean, maybe I, I feel like a white belt because I'm always trying to do something new. I don't want to keep doing the same thing. Um, every day I need to kind of challenge myself in my martial arts career. So if I can learn something new, I just love it. Right on. All right. Now, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, if they're swinging through the New Hampshire area and they're interested in dropping by, maybe, I don't know if you take drop-in guests or anything, how would people yeah. find out what you've got going on, what's going on at your dojo, and how would they reach you? So you can um, check out my, my school website, which is Nima, N-I-M-M-A, dojo.com. My website is there. Um, so if you want to learn a little bit about the school, the instructor, or what we do, you, you certainly can get all that information on, on my website. Um, and you can always give me a call on 603-542-1733. Um, and if I'm not there, I'll definitely give you a call back as soon as I can. That's awesome. I want to thank you for your time here today, all the wonderful things that you've shared. And if you could leave us with just one more thought, some parting words, what would those be? If you treat everybody with respect and, and consideration wherever you go, that will come back to you a um, hundred times and, and you'll just surround yourself with positive people because, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. Sean Sartwell is a dedicated and caring martial arts instructor. Over the last few years, I've gotten to know him and many of his students, and every one of them, including him, is a quality person. His love for teaching knows no bounds, and maybe more importantly, Sean Sartwell is a devoted and caring family man. He never ceases to spend time with that family and make it a priority. His story is one we can all take inspiration from, and I'm happy to call him my friend. Thank you, Sean Sartwell for coming on the show today. If you want to check out the links to everything that we talked about today, you can find them at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You should sign up for the newsletter while you're there. And if you want to check out everything that we do, you can find links, posts, 
products, all of it at whistlekick.com. You can find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick everywhere you can imagine, from Facebook to Twitter to Pinterest, YouTube, Tumblr. Did I say Instagram? Instagram, if I didn't say it. And you can join us in our sort of not quite secret Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. It is the only place that we have sort of off topic podcast discussion. It's the only place that you can contribute to what is happening with the show in upcoming episodes. I want to thank you for your time today. I am honored to be here with you in your ears, wherever you may be. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.